David, how's it going? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Excited to have a chat with you. No problem. Uh, it's my first guest from uh, Switzerland and actually first guest outside of North America. So that's pretty exciting. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, um, your journey so far, and just kind of an introduction. Yeah, cool. So I live in Switzerland, same colors as a uh, Canadian flag, hey, white and uh, red, uh, but different way around. But so I'm, I used to swim hey, um, when I was younger. And um, my highlight was the Olympic Games 2012 in London. And I contribute or I, I would say now looking back, I went to the United States to the University of Virginia, the four years leading up to the Olympics. So from 2008 to 2012, I was in Virginia training there. And that was like just a really beautiful experience where it's all about the team. And I wasn't used to that, right? Swimming in Switzerland is a bit different. It's like, for me, it was always an individual sport. And then I came to the States and everything changed and I got a lot better. And so that was pretty cool. And then after that, I moved into banking because I thought, I had to make a lot of money because that was like the programming and the feeling that I had, because I tell you at the University of Virginia, you know, my classmates, I was studying uh, like finance and my classmates in the summer, I, you know, I was training over the summer, but my classmates, they would go to New York and they do internships with Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, JP Morgan, and they come back and like, oh, yeah, we learned so much. We work, you know, 60 hours, 80 hours a week. And we, yeah, crazy. We already got jobs lined up. And I had nothing, right? So when I was done with swimming, I thought, all right, now I gotta, I have to catch up. So that was the thinking. So I got into banking here in Zurich, which is a good place to get into banking, I guess. And I did that for about four years. And then I just kind of realized that the corporate world isn't for me. And, you know, mainly I was totally still, because now I work with professional athletes on the mindset. But at the time I wasn't aware of any of that, none of it, not in swimming, not in banking. And I just kind of felt that I couldn't recreate the success that I had in swimming. I couldn't recreate it in the corporate world the way I wanted because there's a lot more variables at play, right? There wasn't just a team, the coach and the, the nutrition and the sleep and yourself. There was like so many variables like the boss and the economy and, you know, corporate politics and all that. And I just kind of felt a bit frustrated and, and unhappy, I guess. Well, not unhappy, but like not fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, some dude came along a bit older than me and he started to wake me up to how powerful our mind is. And, um, you know, I bought into that. I started reading books and got coaching on it. And I was like, Oh, I've been sleeping kind of for 30 years to how powerful I am. You are everybody else is. And, and yeah, since then, you know, journey changed. Yeah. Well, it seems to be the case for most people. Um, but glad you, you kind of found the, the path you were looking to to get on and ended up back in sports now what was it like being an olympic athlete you know training for the olympics while uh in university at the same time because i'm sure you had training i know for swimming some people uh that went to my school that that swam were there like you know five in the morning like three hours before school three hours after school how did you find that in the balance Man, so I think that's why I went to the States in the first place, because I kind of knew that, well, I had a lot of fights with my coach here in Switzerland. And at the time, I thought it's he's an asshole. But now I know it was all me, like in difficult teen years and whatever. So, but, you know, anyways, I went to the States and it's all, it's all, you know, it's all coming together when you go to the to school in America for sport, because they have the scholarships you you know it's it's structured in a way your classes are structured your schedule is structured so it's around swimming so we had swimming first and then i would say after that it's like the social life and then the third priority is kind of like school and so that was super super comfortable easy supportive like it was just really cool because i mean the coaches not the coaches the professors if i was missing like an exam because I was on the road traveling. They they didn't care, you know. They were like, ah, oh, no problem. Just take you when you come back. And so that was something that I also wasn't used to because here we had people at the university and they were qualified for the freaking Olympics in 2008. A friend of mine was and and he couldn't. They didn't give him time off to go to the Olympics, right? So he had to. He lost a whole year because he did go to the Olympics and he lost a whole year because he couldn't take the exams later when he came back so you know that, yeah it was just really supportive and and a big upgrade i guess 
in my life to have it that way. Yeah. And then after you graduated, did you know you wanted to go back to Zurich? Was that the plan from the beginning or was that, did you go for jobs specifically or did you just want to come back home type of thing? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I've lived my life like here in Zurich until, and then, oh, that, that was the thing. So I almost forget, <laughs> wow, time's running, but I wanted to get a master's after because I swam like another three quarters of a year after the Olympics. So 2012, was the highlight and then i had another three quarters of a year where i was swimming and i was in spain doing my masters and i just knew you know it's very typical in europe that you get your bachelor's and then you do a master's right after that and right. in america it's it's often you do undergrad right and then well if you become a lawyer or a doctor you have to do grad but in business often people go to work for a little bit and or in engineering they work and then they come back and do an mba and i just yeah so i figured i'll do the master's somewhere in spain and so that's why I came back. And why'd you pick Spain specifically? Because of the weather. <laughs> you know, I had, at the time, I had a pretty good list of things. Like, so swimming was one that had a good club. I was in Madrid. Uh, it was down yeah. between Madrid and Barcelona, but they had a good school. They had, um, you know, they had a good swim team. They, yeah, they had good weather. And I just like kind of, where I just, Ask myself, you know, where do I want to hang out for a year? And and I thought I've never really lived in Spain and learned a bit of Spanish too. So that was pretty good. Good choice, I think. And like academically wise, was there a big difference between going to school in the US versus going to school in Spain, just in terms of teachers and professors and um, how courses are structured and whatnot? You know, that's the thing I would say. So I did one year at the University of Zurich. And I was, and then I came to the States and that was a huge change because here we have these big rooms with like thousands of students in the room and the press professor in front, you have no relationship to that professor, right? I mean, barely. And, and then you have, you don't have to go to class. So it's all like voluntary basically. And then you have like big ass exams in the end where, you know, and, and we, we obviously, you know, we were the type of guys that would not go to school for the entire half year, the whole semester, we wouldn't go and just say, all right, tomorrow we'll go. And, and then we would not go. <laughs> and, and we actually played a game because, you know, we were used to getting up early, but then when we had university and no training in the morning, we just, we were just like, never go. So we started to play a game and say, okay, if the, uh, the, the clock in the kitchen is at seven o'clock, you know, we can go into each other's room and, you know, with my roommate and take a glass of cold water and actually throw it in the guy's face if he's not waking up. And then what happened was, you know, at 6, 658, we were both up and we met in the middle. They were like, well, okay, if we're both awake, let's just go back to sleep. So we just both went in the room. So we never went. And then we had these exams like for two or three weeks where we're up until morning, four or five o'clock drinking Red Bulls and, you know, just very stupid short-term learning. And I didn't remember, I don't remember anything, right? I just yeah. took the test, I passed, and that was it. And then in the States, it was different. The classes were small. I mean, how big are your classes? It depends. So some of the first-year classes, they'd be like three, 400 kids. But if I were, because right now it's all online. If I were back in class now, I think they're like 60, 50, 60 people. So, you know, it's a lot smaller. And then you have labs that are like 25. So you you get to yeah. know your professors later on i think they try to weed out weed out people in first year too right so there's so many and then it just narrows down super quick yeah 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 so that that was the experience that i had in virginia as well as especially the last two years when i got into school of commerce it was so cool i mean we had like in my block maybe 30 people and the professors and yet small group work so that was really like what we learned we also applied right away and I remember the exam week was like open book, right? You could use the internet. And I thought that was so cool because here in Switzerland, we had to memorize all these stupid models that nobody uses. And, you know, like what for? But I wasn't even aware of that at the time. But then in America, I was like, wow, this is cool. You actually get to present something. You get to, you know, interact in a small group, which is definitely something you need later on. So, you know, splitting up the work, uh, meeting late night. I don't know. That was, that was really cool. And it was a huge difference. And then back in Spain, it was very similar. I think they just kind of adopted because it was one of the best schools in, in Europe for the masters. And they're right. adopting, they're not stupid, right? They're adopting the American model that, you know, it's more expensive than the University of Zurich, which is just basically free. 
but I mean, the model, I mean, I don't want to like speak bad about the University of Zurich, but my year there was that I did in the first year, it was worth not a lot, I would say. And then <laughs> in America and in Spain, it was really good. Well, that's good. It's a good thing you uh, didn't go to something worse and change countries and did all that. So let's kind of talk about now Tribe of Athletes and what is it and why did you start it? Yeah, man. I mean, that, that is, that is my passion, right? That, that is my baby. Now this is, this is what I do every day. And so I, I mentor pro athletes on, on their mental game and we give them powerful habits and, you know, accountability methods for mental greatness. And we do that inside of a community with the accomplished athletes and their coaches, basically, because that allows us to you know, come up with these powerful habits and routines that you could, it's almost impossible to do by yourself. And, and so, yeah, this is, this is my baby and this is my passion because I just, you know, I know that the people that are the athletes that are so, so successful, you know, they can see it in their mind. They know what they want. And, and a lot of the athletes, you know, they, and that was including me. I never had a big dream when I was swimming. I was just like roll around and yeah, that, that's good. Yeah, I could do this. Oh yeah, yeah. But I, it was all on autopilot. I, I wasn't in charge of it. I wasn't in charge when I was a banker. I wasn't in charge of my life. It, I, I was under the impression things just happened to me. I attract things, but it's not, it's not true, right? And when you wake up to the how powerful the mind is, and it's yeah. So that's what I do with them. I just you know come clear on what they want and then I help them get it, go and get it. So kind of day-to-day job, what would that be like for you? Yeah. So I wake up early because that is something, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm listening to a lot of podcasts and all that from the industry, right? Cause there's a lot of brilliant people out there. And one of the things that <laughs> one of the patterns that I'm finding is like those people, they kind of get up early. I, you, it's very rare that you have people saying, yeah, I wake up at nine, 10 or so. They wake up early and they do like their most important stuff early in the morning. So what I do is like, I, I wake up early around six or so. I mean, early, you know, for some people, it's not even that early, but, but yeah. Uh, and, and I study, I, you know, I take the time to study, study the mind because I tell every athlete that we have to study the mind and I started the mind. I have my stuff. I have my mentors. So I do that. And then usually I use the morning for strategic meetings with people. Um, also podcasting, getting out the message. And then I use the afternoons for, you know, I do some sport in between, go lifting or do some Brazilian jiu-jitsu or something. And with my friends. And then in the afternoon, usually it's coaching. It's a lot of coaching. And because uh, uh, I have people from America. So it's like good in the afternoon because it's their morning or your right. morning, right? And um, yeah, and then in the evenings also, like we run lives, YouTube lives and that where the community can join. So that's, we usually do that in the evenings when people, you know, are at home and at the end of the day, yeah. But it's, you know, it's very diverse. I mean, I can do what I want. I can work from my laptop. I was in all of April, I was in Egypt, working from Egypt. I mean, that's a beautiful thing, right? If now with the, well, not saying the pandemic is beautiful but i'm just everything is online and everybody understands oh yeah it's online okay cool of course All right yeah yeah and that kind of was what i was going to ask you next but you're able to travel so much while working um in sports doing something you like being online how do you find uh traveling i guess would would your coaching sessions ever be in person or would they are they kind of permanently remote and that allows you to travel yeah i the way I see it is I, you know, one of the exercises that I do is I just close my eyes and I tune into use my imagination to go where I want to be in, you know, I don't want to put a timestamp on it, but in, in a couple of years or so, right. And I see myself in, for example, in the, that's a very vivid picture that I have in one of the Grand Slam tournaments. I, I, I see Australia. <laughs> With the blue court, uh, with the tennis player, I'm I'm there and I'm um, there as a friend, as a mentor, as a fan of of a player, and so you know I think it's both, it's both because what I really, what I find is that once you met a person in person and you like shook hands, gave a hug or whatever, it's really cool to do this online. If the internet is good. If the camera is good, it, there's a there's a real connection. You know, often we also use intuition readings and we use intuition and it's really easy to connect. And we've done it thousands of times and it really works. 
Um, it, but then again, like, you know, after a couple of months or so, it's, uh, yeah, it's just really beautiful to see each other. So that, that would be like my goal to, to definitely meet in person, then work online and then, you know, get back for like the biggest things kind of. So. And I guess that still allows you to travel too, because you're going to see your athletes in person all over the world and finally get to meet them. But so Tribe of Athletes, you started it by yourself? Yeah, I started it by myself because I was coaching executives before that. And as you said, it was sports. Once, you know, I guess my heart never stopped beating for sports. I just kind of forgot about it or I didn't listen. And I went into coaching executives because I was thinking about money. And it was also an easy transition out of banking into coaching executives, right? Um, but then, you know, when the, oh, I was actually only about seven months ago, I just decided, well, why don't I coach athletes? And I just transitioned over and I'll kind of let the executives run out and finish the training. And, and then since then, and now we hired two weeks ago, we just hired first uh, two people and uh, it was, it was more difficult than I anticipated, but there was a good learning in it and good outcomes. So yeah, it's exciting. And how do you find uh, your athletes to, to coach? Do you just reach out to them? I guess you reach out to them online, but do you go through certain organizations or leagues or do you just try to find them yourself? Yeah. So there's, there's a good question, you know, at a, and it's a, it's, I guess, one of those puzzles that you have to solve as a, from a business point of view, but you know, it, it all starts with the, with the mindset that, you know, like, how do I serve these people? And I kind of just really tune into that. And then how I'm going to get there, it's, it's a process that every day it's getting better. But what I found, what works really well. So now, of course, we already have like the email list. We have a website where people, but there's like two, there's two or three things. So the, the one thing I, I reach out to people, my, my, my people reach out to athletes and coaches, also very important coaches, because if you have a cool coach that understands how powerful the mind is, and you know, that is something that I'm seeing. If you look at the NFL, for example, a couple, well, it's been a while now, but a couple of years ago, they had the idea about what happens if we make our players physically stronger and bigger, you know, and, and then they play better, right? And they did that. And there was a lot of demand for strength and conditioning coaches. And then the next step was like, okay, now we got to, you know, eat right. We got to have healthy habits. So, you know, that was the next step. There was a lot of nutritionists coming in, right? And that was like so clear for everybody. But it wasn't always the case because I remember there were swimmers like Ryan Lochte. Have you heard of him? Yeah. Yeah. He, he was eating McDonald's in 2008, right? In Beijing. Hmm. And already at that level, right? So, yeah. and then after Beijing, like, you know, somebody told him like, what the, f you, you know, you got, and then he got a lot better. Uh, and so that was nutritionist. And now I think we're, we're getting to a point and I'm seeing that in the industry and you can like, you know, research that with people researching themselves, mental health, mental toughness, mindset, yeah. all that stuff, it's coming. So we're in a good industry to be in. And so I, I think reaching out to coaches is a good idea as well. So that's what I've been doing. And actually on LinkedIn, I just go, you know, I just go to in, in Swiss soccer, for example, I just go to the highest person I can find in the organization. And I tell them what I do or what we do. And, you know, not everybody replies, but some people all of a sudden do. And if you have that guy, you have, you start to build, uh, you know, a relationship. And, you know, as soon as everything opens up, you go for a lunch or a dinner or whatever, and you start to talk about it. If you have a whole club, then it, it can actually go really, really fast. And so I've been doing that. And then the other thing is to get athletes in and coaches just to get an idea of what we do is that we do a uh, workshop that we call the Unshakable Confidence Workshop. And that is a free event that goes over five days and we meet an hour a day. And we do that on Zoom so we can interact, we can break out into small groups and it, the learning is really powerful because you're not just sitting there and consuming, you have to share, you have to like tell what you're getting, what you're work, what, you know, the insights you're getting. So that's what we do to kind of take them through an experience of that they become aware of how powerful they are. And then we, you know, sell them at the end, we tell them, look, if you want to take this to the next step, if you believe in that, like, you know, here's the thing that you can do. So that's like, the the model that we have at the moment and it's been working well yeah yeah do you find athletes when they come to you guys aren't fully aware of some of like the mental things that are happening within their mind and um kind of you know there's a lot of 
I would think athletes that are like, yeah, I don't really need to work on my mental game. Yeah, it's okay. Do you find a lot of like negative stigma around that or just athletes denying the fact that they need to work on, you know, opening up their mind and whatnot? Yeah, here's the thing. Like I, you know, I don't want to work with people. I don't want to convince anybody. So, you know, that we call that missionary. You don't want to be the missionary who has to like convince people like that. This is a good thing. Needs too much energy. You waste your time, waste your energy, waste your focus. And, you know, it's not worth it because there's, and, you know, I have business coaches that, you know, very good business coaches. And what they're saying is, especially now with, if you have an online business, there is so many customers, clients, whatever you want to call them, like, you know, around the planet that need what you have. And so, you know, just the, the, the question be is more like how, how do you get in touch with them? How do you attract these kind of people with your messaging, with what you put out and all that? So, you know, I'm, I'm sure there is people that think I'm mentally like super strong and it might be true for a lot of, you know, but then good for them. I mean, then they don't, if they don't feel like they need help, if they don't, if they don't want to work on that, it's good. Good for them. Right. It makes sense. Yeah. I guess it, there is with being online, you know, you have access to everyone and pretty much all over. So that is a, an added benefit of, of being able to work online. So what would a like typical coaching session look like? And if it was someone who wanted to get some help that wasn't an athlete, say, for example, I came to you looking to, to get some help. What are kind of the things that you would do or talk about? Um, and how long would the coaching last? Or is it kind of depend on the person? Yeah. So the way I the, the way we do it, and that was inspired I haven't always done it that way. So that's kind of still new is, but it's inspired by my mentor who's running and I'm a partner in his firm. So, and I've been, I've done his curriculum and I'm his student and it's just worked wonders for me. And I've adopted that model for the tribe of athletes. And the model is that you have three weekends where we like fully immerse ourselves. So that's eight hours a day. So eight hours on Saturday, eight hours on Sunday, right? That's one weekend. And we're, we're workshopping because we're immersing with, with, a, with a group of, you know, anything between 20 and, I mean, I, I think I could go up to 100, right? If we get like the registration as we're growing. So, because that's what we do with my mentors. So what we do is we do two days and then we give them like a month or a month and a half off in between so they can integrate the learnings and because it takes a bit of time, right? It's not like you you watch this video and you do this course and then you know how the mind works. It takes, it's a, yeah. it's a journey. And so then we do the next block and the same thing, they get like two months off and then we do the third block. And, you know, if somebody wants to take it to the next step and wants some one-on-one -on -one coaching, I only do one coaching call every two weeks. So it's two coaching calls a month. Because what I found is if it's every week, it's almost like it's almost too much because the people need time to integrate. And the cool thing is that I don't want to teach in a coaching call. I want to use the coaching call to advance that person very, very like specifically to whatever, you know, that person want, what that athlete wants to accomplish. So we use the trainings to give the knowledge and do the exercises together in a group, which works beautifully. And then, you know, they will have basically all they need. And then if they want, you know, they don't even need accountability. I'm not, an, I'm not here to give accountability. You know, they got to be, they got to figure it out for themselves. But, you know, for example, connecting to what your heart really wants. That's something as, you know, it's a process that takes a lot of time. You know, sometimes it, it takes some people a lifetime. And I think for the moment, for example, I know what I really want to do. But who knows, maybe I'll think differently in five years, but that's, you know, you got to wrestle with that question. Why am I here? What's my purpose? What do I want to accomplish? And these bigger questions, I've done that many, many times with people. And I think, you know, if you're, if, if people are new or if you want to take it to the next level, that's a cool thing to have somebody to speak to and somebody like me who can guide you in a sense to find and connect with what your heart really wants. Because when you do that, when you find that, you know, like you're going to be the best version of yourself anyway. Like this is the most powerful thing that can happen. If you know who you are, if you become yourself and, and that's what I use the coaching sessions for. So it's not like me explaining the same things over and over again. And also like for the other person, you know, the learnings can be, they can get that in the, in the group, in the group trainings, very powerfully. 
Yeah. And then we, yeah, we use the one-on-one coaching for intuitive stuff. And do you find some people struggle even after some coaching sessions to still try to figure out what their heart really wants and what they're passionate about and, and stuff like that? Or do you find with the coaching sessions, you know, most people are able to at least get an, an idea. Yeah. So I think, I think they, they definitely, everybody has an idea, but what mm-hmm. there's a constant fight between your, what your heart wants and what your ego wants, what you think you want. And that, that is a fight, you know, that it never stops. It's like, as soon as you, you know, when they say you, you wake up to your truth, you wake up to what your heart wants, who you really are. It's like, if you don't stay awake, you're going back to sleep because our standard mode of operation is from our ego is from, you know, is not from the heart. So you, you know, I think that's what it is. It's like that constant there's an, always a, a battle going on. And I think, you know, the, there's actually a study done by, by Harvard that was done over like 75 years or something. And they asked, you know, the people when they were really old, they asked them, you know, if they were fulfilled. And those that were, you know, they indicated, and I'm not sure if they, if they found the answer to it or not. I think they indicated that they always wrestle with that question you know, why am I here? What is my purpose? And so on. So it's not like something that you get it once and they're like, oh, I got to figure it out because that's what your ego wants. It wants to know how things are. And it's like, oh, now I know, now I know. And then you can quiet yourself down because you think you know, but you don't, right? So it's something that's ongoing, being the best version of yourself. It's not like that now that you know all this, you're going to be the best version of yourself. It's, so, it's You can be the best version of yourself at all times if you just go for your truth, basically. Right, that makes sense. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's kind of a, a, a powerful message and takes a while to try to figure out, but I, I see yeah. where, you, where you're saying you, you got to kind of let that ego guard down and get right to the core and, and figure out what it is you actually want versus what, yeah. you know, what, you, you know, you grow up and you say, your parent, most people say, oh, you should be a doctor, you should be a lawyer, you know, something big that'll that'll pay you well, but a lot of people don't want to do that and a lot of people like things that may perhaps don't pay well so how do you find um especially in in that kind of thing if you have an athlete that wants to go into something that they don't think they'll be able to survive financially off of what would you tell someone um in that case yeah yeah wow good question look that what what i just see in in the world like doesn't matter where is that and you know, we got to be clear on this. This is what it looks like on TV and social media. It's like most people think that they have to have something first, that they can go and do something and then become or be somebody. That's how it looks on TV, social media, you know. But the truth is how it really works is that you close your eyes, you decide who you want to be, then you go out and you do And as an end result, you will have, right? And there's a little bit of a time lag between you deciding who you want to be, you going and doing things and then getting all the the, the physical stuff basically, right? So, but this is how it works. And what, as you said, what people do is like, they have like a feeling of what they want to be doing, what they would love to do, but then they say, oh, but because of this, I can't, right? Because they don't see how it's going to happen they've come up with some kind of excuse why it wouldn't work for them. So they can be a piece and be like, well, you know, I may not like, I may not like really enjoy what I do right now, but at least, you know, it's safe. At least I feel calm. At least, you know, I know mm-hmm. what I have and so on. Right. So they, they kind of, they, they lie to themselves, but you know how it is. If you tell a story like 50 times, you don't know what the original story was. Like if you tell it wrong all the time, you don't remember, you know, you can literally, yeah, that's why I'm such a fan of repetition, because if you use it again and again and again, you can reprogram everything, basically. Right. So so what I would say is, well, you know, that, that's what we do is like just getting them being OK with not knowing how something is going to happen, but knowing what do you want to happen. And then you sit with that. And what happens is you start to attract these things, you know, like you, the, the money is going to come, the opportunity is going to come, the relationship, the, the, the person in your life. Sometimes you can connect with one person and that changes everything, everything. Like, I mean, I, when I met my mentor, it changed everything. And I had a dream, you know, to, well, I still have it, but now it's reality in a sense is yeah. that 
I wanted to facilitate workshops around this, around the world, right? Online. And, and so now I'm a partner with William Whitecloud in the Natural Success Academy. He's my mentor. And literally in beginning of uh, end of July, I'm starting with a thousand people. You know, these are not athletes. So this is separate, but I'm a partner in his firm. But this happened one person. It changed my life. What I learned from him. Right. Now the model that he has that I use for the tribe of athletes, it's crazy. It's just one person. And it yeah. goes so fast. You never know how it's going to happen. And you never know who you're going to meet. You, you know, you could meet the love of your life tomorrow and then the life changes. You, you never know. So you got to know what you want and not how. The how will reveal itself. You got to be okay with that. Yeah, I think that's a pretty powerful message. I was going to lastly kind of ask you if you can narrow this all down. Is there one specific message you would want to share with other um, aspiring, you know, people that want to work in sports, athletes, anything of that sort, just kind of one message you would share? Yeah, I'll tell you in a second, but what do you want? I was just, you know, curious what you want. For for my career? Yeah, man. So for a while, I wanted to be uh, like an NFL agent. Um, and I actually got to work with, um, an agency, did an internship, uh, about a couple months ago for, for a while. And I work with another one right now, just doing some, um, uh, like marketing stuff, but you know, I, seeing how things are remote, I I really like to travel and I want to be able to travel everywhere. So having a remote job, kind of like how you are, and that's what I'm interested, why I'm interested in asking about it. And, um, just being able to travel and work all the time, you know, with having a laptop and not having to go, you know, nine to five to an office Monday to Friday, that doesn't excite me. And just the fact that you have, you know, two weeks of vacation a year, um, you, you can't just say next week that I'm going to go, like you said, travel to Egypt and go work there for eight months. It doesn't work like that if you're in an office. So for me personally, I'm still, I guess, trying to figure it out, like just starting my third year of undergrad right now so I would say it's more or less I want to be able to work in a place where I can travel so being able to work remotely that's kind of my number one and I'm still trying to figure out what that looks like um, but I know definitely that it, an office isn't for me especially being in one place in the world I want to be able to see everything go um, I think I told you we're going on exchange or plan to go on exchange next year and just be able to travel throughout Europe and see what it's like out there. But I want to be able to, you know, go to Thailand and work there for a couple months or go to South Africa and work for a couple months, like anywhere. Um, Cause I just think that's super cool to be able to meet people and go see different cultures and integrate yourself and try new foods, try new things, ways of life. Um, I think that's really cool. And you know, I don't want to sit here in 50 years and say, I didn't travel anywhere. The only life I know is right here. So that's a big thing for me is just being able to travel and go anywhere. Um, but also being able to, you know, financially sustain myself and um, have that kind of lifestyle. It's just, I don't know how that's going to look yet, but sports is something I've wanted to get into for a while. Um, just hearing what you do, it seems really interesting to me too. My aunt works, um, she has her own uh, like natural um, store. She sells jewelry and natural skincare and she does sound therapy and, and different things like that. And I've always found that stuff kind of cool. Um, so it's just, it's interesting to hear from you and I'll definitely look more into what you do, but, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure yet. It's just, that I know the kind of lifestyle I want. It's just, I don't know what that's going to look like yet. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, you know, the, the one tip that has worked really well for me is like, I just, if you have quiet five minutes, literally just close your eyes and, and just go there, you know, because what happens is with the imagination and you, you'll know that as kids, we had a crazy vivid imagination. And then what did I tell you when you grow up? It's like, well, you know, pay attention, be an adult, be realistic. And we kind of dial down our imagination muscle and we don't use it anymore that much. And so what happens is if you start to use it again, it's literally, it's exactly the same as going to the gym. If you just use it once a month, nothing is happening. But if you start to use it every other day and you just sit there for five minutes and you imagine what you really want, even though it's not clear in the beginning, you, you see you go there and all of a sudden you'll start to see more colors, you'll see more shapes, it'll become clearer and clearer and clearer. And so yeah, and you know, that's actually the, you asked me, do you want to know what I would recommend the, the athletes and the people to do? Would it be that? 
I mean, it would be to study the mind, man, because yeah. like the, the hook that I use is that when, when you think about what separates us from animals, it's like, look around in your room, except for the plants that you have behind you there. And I also have some plants, but except for that, we literally, with our mind, created all that shit. Like, look, this, this bottle, it existed in somebody's mind as a, just a thought, just an idea, something non-physical. And with time, we moved it into physical form. The microphone that I'm using, somebody had an idea, just an idea. And with time, we moved it into physical form. You know, the apartment yeah. I'm sitting on, on the 10th floor, somebody had a freaking idea. And now we're, we're, you know, I'm like sitting here looking out on Zurich, even though it's gray as hell. <laughs> you can, I showed you before. But, you know, animals can't do that. And with Michael Jordan, it was the same. He had, you know, he had a dream to be the best basketball player in the world. And he hung out with that dream a lot. And then, you know, he created that. He brought it into physical form, right? So it's creation works the same. And it's all done with our mind. And you got to study it because just because nobody ever told us about it, we didn't learn about confidence in school. We didn't learn about you know, the, the, the law of attraction in school. We didn't learn about right. how to make money in school. Or we didn't learn about relationships in school. These are the most important skills. And we were taught none of that. So you got to do it on your own. And my suggestion is, and that's what I tell everybody is like, you know, find out, find out how powerful you are and you can literally create the life that you love, but you got to know how. So that would be my, <laughs> my message. Hi. Huh? Yeah, that's pretty powerful. I mean, what would you recommend? You said study the mind. Would that be through reading books or um, something, you know, watching videos? Or is there a certain book you would recommend? Uh, you know, I think there's there's in, in, in there's a saying, right, that many ways go to Rome. So I, I believe there is probably an un, for sure an unlimited amount of, of ways how you, you're going to arrive there. Um, you know, for me, it started with a guy telling me that everything that I was thinking, literally in my face, everything that I'm thinking is so subjective and it's not the truth. And I, I sat there and was like, everything that I'm thinking is subjective and not the truth. And I'm like, damn, I think he's right, right? I wanted to argue him, but it's like, well, there's nothing I can say against that. And I started to, yeah, I started to like read books. So one of the books is by my mentor, so I'm biased, but it's called Secrets of Natural Success. Okay. That is, you know, it's a lot about intuition um, because intuition, what is intuition? It's like, you know, listening to your heart and, and so on. So waking up to that. Um, yeah, that's a good book to get started. For example, what I also, what I try to do for athletes and young people is we have a YouTube channel. If you just go tribe of athletes, you know, I try to keep them very, you know, out, not, I'm older than you, but like young and like not so long right. and not so heavy and stuff. So that's also, I think, good ideas on how to get started. But then, you know, you find your own way because, yeah, you got to, you, you know, it's part of the journey to find your journey, right? Everybody's journey is different. So there's no yeah. one size fit all at anyhow. Perfect. I think I'm going to definitely check out that book and read it as soon as I can because sounds like a, pretty powerful message i think it's important especially uh being young and trying to find that out before it's kind of too late and in a sense and 10 20 years down the road and then trying to figure out your purpose you already wasted 20 years of your life so i think that's important and if uh that's really like all the questions i had but is there ways people can connect with you if they want to learn more about tribe of athletes how what's the best way to kind of communicate with you yeah, the best is just the, our website is thetribeofathletes.com. Okay. And if you go there, you have all the social media handles. You can, you know, uh, sign up for the free Unshakable Confidence Workshop that we do. Um, there, there's everything is there. Yeah, my email address is somewhere there. So yeah, thetribeofathletes.com. You'll find everything. Okay, perfect. Well, I enjoyed having you on. It was definitely different. Um, haven't had an episode <laughs> like this especially just talking about the mind that's mostly been people within sports business and definitely haven't had anyone outside of North America. So that's pretty cool too. And I'm glad you reached out and looking forward to putting this together and sharing it with everyone. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Rashad. You're a very good uh, podcast host. And I'm glad to hear that, you know, for your age. I mean, how old are you? 20, uh, 20 and a half, basically. Yeah, so yeah. Like it's a good place to be. And it's good that you're thinking about all these things and uh, yeah, wish you all the best, of course. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it.